It's the amazing Rico Bronia podcast with your host, Evan Roberts. Welcome to Rico Bronia. I am going to warn you, we're going to put the disclaimer out right from the top. This is a very depressing edition of Rico Bronia. Now, you could actually spin it and say it's not that depressing because the Mets have turned their season around. And here as we sit at the All-Star break, the Mets have a season. So when we look back at all the depressing losses of the first half of the year, maybe you'll smile. Maybe you'll say, oh, yeah, I remember when things were this bad, but now they're a lot better. We are commemorating the worst losses of the first half of the season. Uh, I've said this to you before over the last couple of years on the Rico. Sometimes when the Mets have a really bad loss or a really good win, I like to write it down because it's very easy to forget. You know, it's a 162 game season. A lot can happen. And when you watch as much baseball as most of us do, sometimes you forget about that awful game in the second week of April. Sometimes that amazing win in May, eh, you sort of forgot about it. It rubs together with another great win. So since the beginning of the season, I started writing down all of the terrible losses and all of the great wins. Now, today we are focusing on the bad losses. Uh, I started writing them down. I would write down one little note about why the loss was terrible and moved on. As the season has gone on, sometimes your feeling for a game actually gets worse and gets better depending on what happened next. Obviously, the Mets have turned their season around. So some of these losses you may remember and say, oh, yeah, I thought we were dead, but look at the way they responded. That can impact how you think of a loss. So here's how we're going to do it today. We have 10 games. They will not be placed in a particular order. I'm going to give you the 10 worst games, in my opinion, of the first half of the year of 2024. And then when it's all said and done, after reliving it and listening to highlights and me going through some quick notes from my scorecard, we can all kind of agree together, that was the worst loss of the year. Or maybe that was the worst loss of the year. But we're going to do it in chronological order. We're going to start all the way from the beginning and work our way until loss number 10. So doesn't that sound like fun? Doesn't that sound like such a cathartic, all-star break kind of activity? Well, that's what we're going to do on today's edition of Rico Bronia. And now that we've set it up, let's go all the way back to April 1st, 2024. This was the opening game of a three-game series between the Mets and the Detroit Tigers. The Mets had lost the first three games of the season to the Milwaukee Brewers, and you started to feel the heat because at 0-3 and with the Tigers coming to town, despite the Tigers getting off to a 3-0 start, there was this pressure, this pressure of, well, we can't start 0-4. I mean, if we start 0-4, the season's going to go down the tubes. And if you recall on this Monday night, this very crisp, clear Monday night on the first day of April, Sean Manaya was making his New York Mets debut, and much like he finished the first half of the year on a sparkling note, he was unbelievable in his Met debut. In fact, he retired the first 12 guys. And when he did retire the first 12 guys, I had these fears of, oh my God, am I going to miss a perfect game? Then I realized there's no way that's going to happen because clearly Sean Manaya would be pulled after five or six innings. Well, in this case, Sean Manaya gave up a base hit and a walk. Finally, he gave up the walk in the fifth inning. He gave up his first base hit with two outs in the sixth inning, and it was very quickly erased uh, because Carson Kelly was trying to go first to third. So Sean Manaya's day ended with six innings, one hit, no runs, but he did flirt with a perfect game. He pitched four perfect innings. He pitched five and two-thirds perfect innings. But remember at this time, the New York Mets could not hit. I know that sounds foreign, considering the way the Met bats have exploded. They could not hit in this game, so it remained a 0-0 game, despite the Mets having a million opportunities. They had two on in the first inning with nobody out, didn't score. They had a runner on second, two outs in the sixth inning, didn't score. Lead-off man on in the seventh, didn't score. Lead-off man in the eighth, didn't score. Base runner in the ninth inning, didn't score. Went all the way to the tenth inning, and in that tenth inning, with the free runner on second base, you may recall that Michael Tonkin was a New York Met. And Michael Tonkin proceeded to hit a batter. Joey Wendell made an error. And then finally, with the Mets down 2-0 in the 10th inning, Carson Kelly 
decided to stick it up our ass. One pitch is hit high in the air down the left field line. It is gone. In the top of the 10th, the Tigers have exploded for five runs. Carson Kelly has now hit a three-run home run off Michael Tonkin in the 10th. They are headed for the exits at City Field in a game that featured no runs at all. Tigers have splashed five in the top of the 10th. What a shot by Kelly, his first of the year. 2-1. Yeah, wasn't that fun? That was a real kick in the you-know-what. One of the many losses the Mets have had in extra innings at home. That's something that has actually been a trend in the first half of this year. So the Mets lost 5-0 in 10 innings. That is horrible loss number one. Horrible loss number two would actually come just a few short days later. The Mets were playing game two of their three-game series against the Tigers. It was actually the first game of a doubleheader that the Mets were playing because they had a couple of rainouts. So they are a day later game-wise. They're 0-4. This is the next game they played after they lost that 5 nothing game. This time, the Mets had an extra inning loss, but they really decided to stick it through our heart. This was a really good one. The Mets actually built a 3 nothing lead. Remember early this season, early in the season, Francisco Alvarez was on a rampage. Well, he was doing it in this game. He had a two-run double in the third inning that gave the Mets the lead. Brett Beatty had an RBI single. Remember him. And they actually had a 3 nothing lead in the sixth inning. Adrian Hauser got into a little bit of trouble in the sixth inning. And with a very low pitch count, Carlos Mendoza decided to pull him. And actually, I remember Hoff and I on the Rico very early in the season having a disagreement about this decision. I supported Mendoza pulling Adrian Hauser. And Hoff said, 67 pitches. What the hell are we doing? Well, it turned out to sort of work because Brooks Raley came in and pitched very, very well. But then Drew Smith came in and gave up a run. Seemed innocent. Still 3-1. to one. Adam Adovino came in and gave up a run. And all of a sudden, this is a 3-2 to two game. And then finally, Riley Green hit a game-tying home run in the eighth inning. So a 3 nothing lead slowly dissipated into a 3-3 tie. The Mets had a great opportunity to win the game in the bottom of the ninth inning. They did not when Francisco Alvarez grounded into a double play. They actually got through the 10th inning. Remember Jorge Lopez? Remember that guy? Got through the 10th inning. The Mets couldn't score in the bottom of the 10th inning. And then the Tigers, you know, did what they did. They stuck it up our ass in the 10th inning. Now, you may forget, who's the guy that really stuck it? Well, that'd be former Yankee Gio Urshela. The 0-2, breaking ball hit in the air, shallow center, tough play. McNeil out, can't reach it. Base hit, two runs will score. Beerling is in, Keith right behind him, scores. On at first with a two-run single, his third hit of the game, Gio Urshela. And the Tigers have opened up a 6-3 to lead here in the this was a real test for us as Met fans because 0-5 is not normal. I know we had that experience in 2005, and the Mets actually recovered pretty quickly. But that loss, another extra inning loss, back-to-back extra inning losses to the Detroit Tigers and blowing a 3 nothing lead sent us to 0-5. And luckily, as I said, we can have a good chuckle about it now because of the way the Mets have played. Uh, to close out the first half of the season and really get to where they are, which is being in the middle of a pennant race. But that was a depressing time, and that was a brutal loss. Now, as you will hear in the best wins of the first half edition of the Rico Bronia, the second game of the doubleheader was actually one of those great victories that helped begin to turn the season around. But that afternoon loss in front of, like, no people at City Field was pretty freaking bad. We actually jump a few weeks later to April 29th, 2024, and that is horrible loss number three. It was against the Chicago Cubs at City Field, and I really thought selfishly this was going to be an incredibly unique night. That night, I was going to the game with my father. My back had locked up really badly. I do have a bad back. I've talked about that a little bit. Got run over by a taxi a few years ago. And on that day, my back got very, very bad. Coincidentally, my dad calls me up and says, son, I can't go to the game. And I said, what's going on? And he said, my leg is locked up. I cannot move my leg. I can't walk. Now, luckily, we were getting off the air early that day. So I was driving to City Field. And so I said to my dad, let me ask you a question. I I understand your legs in bad shape. 
if I picked you up so you weren't taking the train, which he normally does, if I pick you up from an apartment in Queens, which is where he was staying, would you want to go to the game? And he's like, yeah. You know what? If you could pick me up, screw it. Let's go to the game. So I pick him up. We go to the game. Now, what the hell does all this mean? Here's what it means. We sit down. We watch Brandon Nimmo hit a leadoff home run to give the Mets a 1-0 lead. And then we watch Luis Severino go to work. One no-hit inning. Two no-hit innings. Three no-hit innings. Four no-hit innings. Five no-hit innings. Six no-hit innings. Seven no-hit innings as we go to the eighth inning. And as the no-hitter is developing, I have seen two in my life firsthand, Johan Santana and Chris Heston. My dad has only seen Chris Heston. was not at the Johan game. We're looking at each other thinking, we were about to not come to this game. We are the walking wounded. Are we going to watch Luis Severino pitch a no-hitter? His pitch count was reasonable. It was at 79 pitches going into the eighth inning, but it's only a one nothing lead, and that's the problem. And Severino issues a leadoff walk. He gives up a base hit to Dansby Swanson, which turns out to be a killer. And then we get the moment. Now, I'm going to play the clip, or Hoff's going to play the clip. He's the one who did a great job pulling all these clips. So I ain't taking credit for it. Hoff's going to play the clip. I'm not setting it up. I just want to see if you guys remember that piece of shit that used to play on the New York Mets named Joey Wendell. So ladies and gentlemen, April 29th, 2024, Luis Severino trying to get through the eighth inning. Push at third, Mervis at first, one out, we're in the eighth. Severino about to deliver pitch number 97. It's on the way, and it's a broken bat roll at a third. Wendell up with it, fires to second. One, McNeil to first, not in time, and the tying run scores. Bush it. And here's the problem for those that forgot. Joey Wendell needed to throw home. It was one of the most brain-dead plays we have seen. It was the first check mark. Actually, it wasn't even the first. It was like the second check mark against Joey Wendell's tenure as a New York Met. He needed to throw home. If he throws home, he easily gets Michael Bush at the plate. Instead, he doesn't. He tries to turn an ill fate to double play, and a one nothing game becomes a one-to-one game. Again, this was the time where the Mets could not hit. They had big problems scoring runs. So when Edwin Diaz was on a mound in the ninth inning, he could not make a mistake. And behind three and one to Christopher Morrell, guess what he did? He made a mistake. Three one pitch. Morrell hits it high in the air to deep left field. Nimmo going back at the wall, and it is gone over the great wall of Flushing beyond the 358 mark. Christopher Morrell with his fourth home run of the year, a two run homer off of Edwin Diaz. And now in the top of the ninth inning, the Cubs have taken a 3-1 to one lead. Three. And to make matters worse, the Mets get two on and one out in the bottom of the ninth inning, and DJ Stewart and Brett Beatty both strike out as pinch hitters. So you got a lot of teases. You had the no-hitter tease. You had the Joey Wendell has, you know, a foot for a brain tease. You get Christopher Morrell hitting one 5,000 feet tease. And then the Mets kind of give you that little threat that they're going to come back and they don't. <laughs> and they lose that game to the Chicago Cubs. That's horrible loss number three. Number four was very bad. Very, very bad. I think this is a legitimate candidate to be the worst loss of the first half of the season. The Mets are playing the Tampa Bay Rays. They've dropped the game under 500 and they're on the verge of being swept by this mediocre Tampa Bay Raid team. It's kind of a back-and-forth game. Mets take an early 2-0 late on a Francisco Lindor two-run home run. Tampa Bay comes back against Luis Severino. They score three runs in the bottom of the second inning to go up 3-2. Mets tied at three. Rays go back ahead. It's 4-3. Mets score two runs in the fourth inning to go back up. Uh, they get an RBI hit from Omar Narvaez. They get an RBI hit from Brandon Nimmo. And the Mets have a 5-4 to four lead, and that's where things sit for a very long time. It's 5-4. They get five innings out of Luis Severino. Jorge Lopez gives him a scoreless inning. Reed Garrett gives him a scoreless inning. Sean Reed Foley gives him a scoreless inning. And the Mets are on the verge of salvaging the final game of this three-game series against the Tampa Bay Rays. They lead 5-4. to four. I was sitting at my parents' house in Copig Falls, New York. This was that's how vi that's how much this loss pissed me off. I remember vividly where I was sitting and what I was saying on this Sunday afternoon. 
There are two outs and nobody on. And Randy Arozarena, who at the time, I ain't making this up, was hitting 136. That was his batting average. There are two outs and nobody on. And Randy Arozarena against Edwin Diaz did this. Diaz has run it full. Brings the hands together. Here's the payoff pitch. Swing at a high fly ball deep to left field. Back goes Nimmo onto the track. It's gone. A game time home run for Randy Arozarena. With the Mets a strike away from ending it. Diaz gives up the home run. Diaz is running. Yeah. I mean, you can hear the disgust in Howie Rose's voice. <laughs> like, that is a, you got to be freaking kidding me. When you are one strike away, when you are one out away, when there are two outs and nobody on, and obviously you're facing a guy who had not hit all season long, that was a backbreaker. Mets scored a run in the 10th inning. Actually, they did it on an error, too. That gave them the one-run lead. It was a gift from the gods when I think it was Yandy Diaz made an error on a ground ball that he just basically dropped on a throw to first base. Mets take the lead. And then Jake Diekman. Oh, Jake Diekman. I want to, you know, we've mentioned a lot of names of guys who aren't even here anymore. You've heard a little bit of Joey Wendell, a little bit of Jorge Lopez. Brett Beatty is still sort of here, but in the minor leagues for most of the first half of the year. But Jake Diekman is still here. And Jake Diekman was given the opportunity to try to close the game in the 10th inning. And the first thing he did was walk a batter, Ben Rortvet, remember him? And then very promptly let Johnny DeLuca end the game. The count was 0-2. This is the one that drove me nuts. I, I, I forgot. I'd never forget this one. He's ahead 0-2. And, and I'm like, can you can you bury one in the dirt? And I think DeLuca fouled a few balls off. And then finally, on 0-2, Johnny DeLuca got a cookie. And you know what he did with that cookie? He did this with the cookie. First and third for the Rays, the pitch. Line towards center field. Bader sprinting to his right, dives, can't get it. It rolls behind him. Caballero scores. The ball's on the warning track at the wall. Lortfit rounds third. He comes home to slide in safely. Johnny DeLuca and the Tampa Bay Rays win it in the bottom of the 10th inning. First and third. Yeah, yeah. So that was just the uh, finishing touches on a sweep at the hands of the Tampa Bay Rays. Awful loss. This is definitely a candidate for a worst loss of the first half of the year. About a week later, the Mets were playing the Philadelphia Phillies. It was that weird home and home, two games at City, two games in Philadelphia, and they were just coming off a great win. The Mets had salvaged the last game of the three-game series against the Atlanta Braves by winning on a walk-off home run by Brandon Nimmo. It was pretty cool. It was a Sunday night game. I was there with my son, Jet. Awesome, awesome victory. They come back on Monday at 19 and 20, taking on the first place Philadelphia Phillies. Eight games out of first place. So if you had a fantasy about getting back into the National League East race, this was the moment to do it. And the Mets actually built a 3-1 to one lead, a 4-2 to two lead, and they took that into the ninth inning. They were 4-2 to two going into the ninth inning, and here comes Edwin Diaz. This was the you know, you, you heard the Tampa game. Now you're hearing the Philadelphia game. This was peak. What the hell is wrong with Edwin Diaz? Maybe we should start to be worried. He immediately gave up a home run to Bryson Stott, which made it a one-run game. Put two guys on base. But then was able to get two big outs. And so there were two on and two out, up by a run. He walked with Merrifield, but got ahead of Alec Bohm. So it felt like, okay, this is going to be an adventure. But Edwin Diaz is going to find a way to not blow this save. He's ahead of Alec Bohm 0-2. 0-2. And then this happened. Bohm ready in the batter's box. 0-2 the count. Here's the pitch. Check swing, but a ball appeared to have hit him in the hand. Now, did he swing the bat? What are they going to say? If not, he's been hit by a pitch, and the tying run is scored. Bohm ready in the batter's Yep. Well, that's what happened. He was hit by a pitch and the tying run scored. And then they scored the winning run on a sacrifice fly after a wild pitch was uncorked by Sean Reed Foley. And so the Manfred man scored. That gave the Phillies the lead. And then in the bottom of the 10th inning, Joey Wendell, Harrison Bader, and Jeff McNeil went down meekly. 
and the Mets had themselves an absolutely gut-wrenching loss to the Philadelphia Phillies. Bad loss. Worst loss of the season? I don't know. I think the one we're about to do may be the worst loss of the season. It happened about five days later. It was Saturday, May 18th. The Mets are now really struggling. They lost three out of four to Philadelphia. They got shut out on a Friday night by the Miami Marlins, a game they were non-competitive in. And the Mets have now dropped to four games under 500. This is where things are starting to kind of spiral. You're starting to sort of get worried about Edwin Diaz, but you're not sure. Well, it's a Saturday late afternoon game. The Mets are playing the Miami Marlins. The Mets get Luis Severino to pitch in the seventh inning, into the seventh inning. They actually gave Severino a pretty big lead. The Mets led in this game seven to two. Seven to two, not too bad. Severino starts the seventh, puts a couple of guys on base, gives up a couple of hits. Finally, he gets pulled for Reed Garrett. Reed Garrett gives up a couple of hits. And all of a sudden, the game becomes seven to five. Marlins make it a little bit closer. Okay. The Mets get some huge hits in the ninth inning. Brandon Nimmo gets a double. J.D. Martinez gets a double. Starling Marte drives in a run. And the Mets add what appeared to be some very important insurance runs and gave them a 9-5 to lead going into the ninth inning, which led to a, a big decision for Carlos Mendoza. You know, Edwin Diaz has been struggling a little bit. It's a four-run lead, so it's not a save situation. What do you want to do? Do you want to not use Edwin Diaz, maybe steal a few outs from Jorge Lopez, give Edwin Diaz another day? Or do you say to yourself, you know what? Edwin's been struggling. Let me go to him with a four-run lead. Let me get these three outs, call it a day, and we all move on. Well, Mendoza decided to go to Edwin Diaz in a non-save situation with a four-run lead. He gave up a leadoff double, but then got the next guy out. And so it's like, all right, four-run lead, one-on-one -on -one out. Then Edwin Diaz gave up an RBI single to Jazz Chisholm. Then he gave up an infield single to Brian De La Cruz. And all of a sudden, the tying run came to the plate. And before the at-bat with Josh Bell even got started, before you could settle in for the battle that Edwin Diaz was involved in, Josh Bell stunned us. This one really hurt. It was 9-5. Now it's 9-6, and by the time Josh Bell was done swinging, it was 9-9. First pitch. Bell swings and drives a high fly ball. Center field. Bader back to the track. He looks up, and it's gone. Josh Bell has tied the game in the ninth inning, homering off Edwin Diaz. First pitch. You, you can hear the absolute disgust in his voice. And, and one thing to keep in mind, a few days earlier, Edwin Diaz had blown a save in Philadelphia. He'd given up an RBI single to Bryson Stott, but then the Mets won that game in 11 innings. It was one of their better wins of the year, but it was on the heels of another Edwin Diaz blown save. So Edwin had been on a stretch where he'd really, really been struggling. And obviously this was the topper. This was the, holy crap, we may be stuck in 2019 kind of moment. The Marlins ended up winning an inning later. I didn't even want to play the clip because it was just so... All right, you want to hear the clip? All right, fine. Otto Lopez, two batters into the bottom of the 10th inning, did this against Jorge Lopez. Infield tight, 1-1 one, one pitch. Swinging a ground ball, back up the middle into center field, a base hit. Bethancourt trots home. It's a walk-off single for Otto Lopez, and Miami scores four in the bottom of the ninth against Edwin Diaz and wins it in the 10th infield. Yeah. <laughs> It put us out of our complete misery, and the the route was on. And by route, I mean our collapse. The collapse was in full motion during that series against Miami, losing the first two games and losing that game on a Saturday. About a week later, the panic really set in. That was when I decided, hey, I should cut my beard. I should do something to try to spark the New York Mets. Remember that? Remember the old days when I used to have a beard? It was uh, grown out out of loyalty for Pete Alonzo, who half of you people want to trade. Uh, I grew the beard out. It was solidarity with Pete. And then finally, as the Mets continued to struggle, I decided I got to do something. I got to try to spark this team. And so I did that at our big Memorial Day kickoff to summer show. Well, that day was May 24th. And my thought was maybe this can get the Mets going. And when I got home that night, this is one of those rare games 
that I actually didn't score. Uh, usually the games I don't score are the ones that I'm on the air for, but I was very tired. It was a long day. I was so excited for the beard to be gone that I just sat down. I watched this game like a regular, normal human being. And I watched the Mets build a big lead. The Mets built a 6-2 to two lead going into the eighth inning. And I started to think, wow, this is going to work. Oh, my God. Cutting the beard is going to spark the New York Mets. I'm going to be able to look back at this and say this was a great decision. And that all went for naught when Reed Garrett took on Patrick Bailey in the eighth inning with a big lead. Garrett sets, 2-0 pitch. Swing and a drive. Well hit right center. It might go. Marte back. It's going to go. A grand slam from Patrick Bailey into the Giants' bullpen in right center field. And the Giants have come all the way back once again and now lead this game 7-6. to six. <laughs> I mean, you can't make it up. That's just one of those. You, you can't make it up. So, the day I cut the beard, trying to spark the team, the Mets blow another game. The following day, the Mets are playing the San Francisco Giants again, and it's kind of like deja vu. Luis Severino's pitching a no-hitter. He's off to a really, really good start. He retires the first 12 guys he faces, four perfect innings on just 36 pitches. He did issue a walk in the fifth inning, finally gives up a base hit in the sixth inning. A game I wasn't at, so I was getting a little bit nervous. Oh, crap, am I going to pitch uh, miss a no-hitter? Starling Marte had given the Mets the lead one nothing, But in the sixth inning, the Phillies came back and tied it. Patrick Bailey was at it again, made it a one to one game. Mets retook the lead when Brett Beatty hit a home run to give him a 2-1 to -one lead. And guess what? Well, here's something nuts. The Mets went to the ninth inning with another lead. It was like, oh, okay. Right. Nice little bounce back effort. This will be nice. Edwin Diaz was on the mound. <laughs> And he gave up a leadoff hit. He got a big strike out of Mike Yastrzemski. And then Lamont Wade came up with a runner on second and one out. And the Mets holding on to a one-run lead. And can you believe it happened again? 1-1 one, one pitch. Line to right field. A base hit. It's headed towards the corner. It's going to tie the game. It goes to the wall. Wade on his way to second. Marte with the throw. It's there in plenty of time. And out at second base is Wade. But that's after McKenna scores the tying run on a single by the pinch hitter Lamont Wade Jr. Even though he is thrown out at second, the Giants have tied the game 2-2. Two two, and it's another blown save for Edwin Diaz. One, one. Another blown save for Edwin Diaz. Uh, they would eventually lose the game in the 10th inning, uh, and it was another one of those crooked numbers that were put up. The Giants scored five runs in the 10th inning. It was capped off by a three-run bases-clearing triple by Mike Yastrzemski. It included an RBI single by Brett Whistley, an RBI walk by Patrick Bailey. It just it gave you all the, uh, the crap of a bingo card. And the Mets lost again to the San Francisco Giants, Seven to two. Here's the good news. It feels like we're getting really close to rock bottom. Like we've made our way into the depths of May and into the depths of our despair. We've only got two more. Here's game number nine. Game one of the doubleheader against the Los Angeles Dodgers. The Mets had jumped out to an early 2 nothing lead and watched as the Dodgers slowly came back. Francisco Lindor had hit the home run that gave him a 2 nothing lead. And then the Dodgers were able to come back by scoring a run in the eighth inning. Freddie Freeman had an RBI single. What else is new? And then in the ninth inning, Chris Taylor singled on a bunt to Adam Adovino to tie the game up at two. And then the Dodgers would go ahead on a Mookie Betts single in the 10th. And then because this is what happens when the Mets are in extra innings, they would have to be an exclamation point. And the exclamation point would come from a guy that has killed us for many, many years, Freddie frickin' Freeman. That's it for us, one out, pitch. Swing and a crank deep to right field. Marte turns, it is out of here. Freddie Freeman adds insult to injury. This guy has killed the Mets. It's a two-run home run in the 10th. It is now 5-2 Los Angeles with one out. That's it for yeah. That's exactly what we witnessed. Now, what also happened in this game was this was the infamous Jorge Lopez game. 
This was the first game of a doubleheader. They would lose the second game of the doubleheader in a lifeless 3 nothing loss. But this is when Jorge Lopez threw his glove, then came out and was not apologetic about it with the media. Then I think he had some things lost in translation about being the worst teammate and the Mets possibly being the worst team. That day was rock bottom. And I totally get if you want to take that loss because of the symbolism that was around it and say that's the worst loss of the season, only because it did feel like rock bottom. Now, there is one more game I included because, and I was talking to Big Mac about this, Chris McMonigle, who's our overnight guy, and is a great baseball fan. He thought, and I totally understand where he's coming from on this, that the game we're about to talk about was the game that buried the New York Mets. Because remember, the Mets have the team meeting after this. Jorge Lopez is DFA'd. Absolute rock bottom. They come out the next night against the Arizona Diamondbacks, and they win, right? Then the following night, they win again. So all of a sudden, it's like, well, maybe the Mets are responding to this. They lose a game to Arizona on Saturday, but they've still won the first two of three. And then on Sunday, they're taking on the Arizona Diamondbacks. They go down early 3-0. They quickly respond by scoring four runs in the third inning, a two-run triple by Brandon Nimmo, an RBI triple by J.D. Martinez. They go up four to three. The Mets go to the ninth inning with a lead, with a four to three lead. They're about to win three out of four against the Diamondbacks. They're going to get to nine games under 500 and at least give you, I guess, a pulse that they're turning this season around. And in the ninth inning, Jake Diekman, is the guy who Mendy is asking to get three outs from. He gives up a leadoff double to Gabriel Moreno and then a shocking two-run home run to Cattell Marte, his second of the game, that gave the Diamondbacks the lead and eventually the win. I was at that game. I took my family to that game. And I do remember leaving, and I'm sure you can go back to the archives of the Rico Brony on that one, thinking, wow, okay. I, I thought we were going to go on a run. I thought this was the spark, and look what just happened. I mean, a devastating loss to the Arizona Diamondbacks. Another game in which the Mets have a lead and they blow it. How many can you take? And Big Mac was telling me that on his overnight that night, that was his night where he said the Mets are dead. And I don't blame him. Like, it would be tough to say what a crazy opinion. So that is a very underratedly bad loss. Now, what we ended up witnessing is, the Mets turned it around after that. Like, if you're looking for a line of demarcation on when this season turned, I can't say that that loss did it, but what I can tell you is that after that series was over, the Mets swept the Washington Nationals. The Mets got the London split against the Philadelphia Phillies. The Mets had that incredible two out of three against Miami sweep of sand. Like, that, that was where the run began. So that loss on June 2nd was bad it was awful and as of right now because obviously we have a whole second half in front of us that may be the worst last loss of the season but i digress there will be another bad loss i can promise you that. <laughs> hopefully it's not you know the devastating one we talk about for the next 15 years so those are my 10 worst losses of the 2024 first half if I had to pick one and I go through them now, Pete, I ask you uh, as someone that experienced all of this together, like we're, we're family. We've talked about all these games, obviously on the Rico, some of which we did instant reactions to some of which we just talked about in the series recap. If you had to pick one, which one would you go with? I think the Marlins loss because they had such a big lead. Jazz Chisholm with the hit. And by the way, he hasn't been playing that great this season anyway. He's not like as electric as we make him out to be. And then the Josh Bell home run just really like like killed me. Because you, you're supposed to – the Marlins suck. You're supposed to beat these teams, and they 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 completely blew it. It was, it was terrible. Yeah. I mean, anytime you have a four-run lead in the ninth inning, that's as bad as it gets. I, I remember being numb when that was happening. Same thing with the Giant game, the Patrick Bailey Grand Slam. Like, there was a numbness to it. I, I always try to think, like, okay, I'm going to close my eyes and try to remember my stomach ache after a certain loss and what really pained me the most. And believe it or not, if I did that as my test, like, if that was really the, the indicator, 
The one that really pissed me off was that game against Chicago earlier this season where Seve had the no-hitter and they had this one nothing lead and Joey Wendell made the boneheaded mistake. And then, you know, that ties the game. Morrell hits a bomb of a home run. They've got an opportunity in the ninth inning. I think that one probably bothered me in the moment the most. But if I had to pick one, it's between the Marlin game. Like, that is obviously a great choice. And I would say the Arizona game. Like, to have another blown lead like they did on June 2nd, especially after it looked like they were restarting the season, I think that Diamondback loss was really, really bad. I think what tempers it, though, is the fact that they've turned it around. <laughs> that, that, that that moment is kind of like the last bad moment up until now. Obviously, a lot can change. So, I think overall, I'm going to go with the Arizona game, but I, I do think that Marlin game is a, a very close second to worst games of the season. I, I will say this too. I got to give an, I, I do think the Tigers lost the game five, the fifth loss in a row was really bad because it set a tone for the season where Mets fans, I don't think really, really some people didn't recover from for quite a while. Still gives us that like, you know, trepidation of, do we really want to trust this team? When can we trust this team? And even now being, you know, a few games over 500, are we still trusting this team? I, I, I'm locked in, but not everybody. Well, you know, it's it's exciting. I think we're all excited. I think we're all very, very nervous about this bullpen. And what a lot of these losses have in common is that a lot of them are bullpen defeats. I mean, basically all of them are games that were blown. And obviously when you're talking about worse losses, that's the way they usually go. I mean, very rarely are you going to find just a you know, one nothing loss. I did have one that I was considering, the one nothing loss they had to the Cubs in that same series a few days later after the Luis Severino game. But for the most part, they are games in which your bullpen blows it. And that is our big trepidation. You know, as Met fans going and hanging out here in the All-Star break, that's our biggest problem. Our biggest problem is the bullpen and our fear that all of these losses that we got damaged by in the first half of the year, we may have more in the second half of the season. And dare I say in the postseason, if the franchise gets there. If we missed any losses that you're like how did you not include this you can obviously email us the rico b at gmail.com we will address them in a future rico bronia so if there is something we miss certainly let us know what was your opinion what was the worst loss of 2024 i gotta tell you we've done worst lost episodes before uh season recaps we've done worse losses this one is not as painful even listening to all those clips and i think it's because we're in a good place because we feel positive about the future and because the Mets were able to overcome all of these blown games to put themselves in the position they're in now at the all-star break. So maybe not as depressing as I warned, but either way, we appreciate you downloading, subscribing, and listening to Rico Bronia. Don't worry. As depressing as this was, the best wins of the first half of the year. That's coming up in a few short days. Thank you very much for listening to Rico Bronia. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Rico Bronia podcast. It's amazing, isn't it? Make sure you download it now to keep it on you at all times. <laughs>